Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Exodus in chapter number 17. Exodus in chapter number 17. And uh, when you found your place, if you stand together with me, please, for the reading of God's Word. Exodus and chapter number 17 as we continue through the book of Exodus on Sunday morning. And we're going to begin in verse number 8. We left off with uh, verse number 7 last week, and so we'll start here in verse number 8 and read down to the end of the chapter. Uh, The Bible says in Exodus chapter number 17, I'll read aloud as you follow along, beginning in verse number 8, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rehoboam. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses said unto him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up on top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that the Israel, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Mer stayed, Aaron and her stayed up his hands, the one on one side, and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomforted Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for memorial in a book. And rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. For he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, as we look at this portion of Scripture, Lord, that you might give us some understanding. That you might illuminate to us the truth and you might help us. Lord, in our own lives, Lord, that we might learn from this example. Lord, as we have seen, the Scripture tells us that the things that happened to the children of Israel in the wilderness were written for our example, that we may be instructed thereby. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us, that we would be instructed, that we would determine not only to be obedient, Lord, but we might recognize who is the God of victory, who is our banner. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As we've gone through the book of Exodus, uh, we've come to this place in chapter number 17. If you remember that they're in this place, the Bible says in verse number 1, and and Riedem, the name Riedem is a place of rest. They've come to a place of rest. And wouldn't you know, as soon as they get there, they have no water. It's hard to rest when you don't have any water. And they begin to murmur against the people and they begin to to chide or they begin to murmur against Moses and chide with Moses and and Moses is like, What do you want me to do? You know, how am I gonna make water? And so he prays to God and God tells him to go and hit the rock. And we learned about that last week week and who our rock is. Our rock is Jesus Christ, and he was broken for us, and he was bruised for us, but Uh, Through His brokenness and through the provision that was made by Him as He was broken upon the cross of Calvary, that we too have provision. Praise the Lord for that. But can you imagine the scene after the water came? Man, after the water came. The water comes gushing out of the rock. Enough water, the Bible told us, to, to nourish all the people, all the families, all the cattle. There's some 2 million people, if we would... Uh, take a calculation of the fighting men and determine those fighting men having families and those fighting men potentially having children. Uh, There's some 2 million people that water provided. Think about right after Thanksgiving dinner. I love Thanksgiving dinner. But right after Thanksgiving dinner, you know what you do? You push back from the table... You go over and sit on the couch and you say, don't touch me. Leave me alone. Kids, go out and play out back. For, for some reason, kids still have energy to go play. I don't understand it. Go play out back. And you sit down and you're like, uh. But it is so satisfying, man. What a blessing Thanksgiving dinner is. Man, I love Thanksgiving dinner. 
Can you imagine? They have been thirsty. They have been without water. And all this water comes and they drink to their fill and they're in this place of rest. Man, the joy that must have been there and, and, uh, and how that camp is spread out. And if you were to look off, you would see in the distance, uh, there is a, there's a valley over off in the distance. And everybody is relaxed. And everybody is just <sighs> satisfied. Man, what a great, great time. The Bible says this in verse number 8. Then came Amalek and fought with the children of Israel in Riedah. Now, the name Amalek means people of the valley. That's what it means. The person Amalek is an offspring of Esau. Remember Esau, the wild man? He will produce Amnon and Edom, and he will produce Amalek. What's interesting is we read this in Exodus that, you know, we read it this way, then came Amalek and they fought. All right. But there's more to the story and the Bible gives us insight. It actually tells us in two different places, in Deuteronomy and also in in Samuel there in chapter number 15. But let's go to Deuteronomy chapter number 25. Deuteronomy chapter number 25, and then this is repeated when, if you remember, Saul, by the direction of God, and through the uh, direction of Samuel, will be, go, will be told to go and destroy all of Amalek. And it's for this reason. Deuteronomy chapter 25, look what it says in verse number 17. Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse number 17. It says, Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way, when ye were come forth out of Egypt. So do we understand the time frame? We have watched the children of Israel come out of Egypt. We've watched them turn bitter water sweet. We've watched them receive manna and quail. We've watched them now receive water from a rock. We're talking about this very incident. It says, Remember what Amalek did what Amalek did unto thee by the way when you were come forth out of Egypt. How he met thee there by the way. How he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee even all that were feeble behind thee when thou was faint and weary and he feared not God. So here they are in this process and you can imagine in a camp of, of two million people that uh, not everybody is young, not everybody is strong, uh, not everybody is, is uh, in, in, in as good a position as everybody else. There are some that are feeble. There are some that are weak. There are some that are elderly. There are some that are, that are young. And oftentimes uh, they will be, they will be uh, just by sheer necessity on the outskirts of the camp. When you think of them marching and coming, uh, they would begin to fall behind a little bit. And so ultimately, when camp is set up, here they are on the outskirts of camp. And the Bible tells us in Exodus that they came up and fought, and Deuteronomy tells us how Amalek did it. In the process of time, Amalek would be watching from the valley, and they would not come as a frontal assault. They would not come and attack uh, Joshua and attack Moses. They would not come at the pillar of the cloud. They would wait until the children of Israel would begin coming past them, and they would come and they would attack the feeble. They would attack the weak. They would attack the ones that were in the rear of the party, in the rear of the camp, those that were easy pickings, and they would attack them. And they were uh, continually to be a nuisance to them and, and destroying them and attacking them. And finally, here we are at a place... And God says, all right, we're going to take the battle to them. We're going to take the battle to them. Now, before I get too far, can I tell you, this is still the way the attack comes. Most of the time, the attack doesn't come, uh, by the way, I just want to let you know, I'm going to destroy your children this week. By the way, I just want to let you know that uh, I'm out to destroy your marriage. So I wanted to give you some heads up. Uh, There's some things that are happening, and it's what I'm going to use to destroy your marriage. Is that the way the devil works? Most certainly. It's not the way the devil works. Can I tell you this? That's not even the way our flesh works. Your flesh tells you this in the morning when you wake up. You know, I know you don't feel like getting up, 
but it's really the right thing to do. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to fight against the right thing to do, just to let you know. I'm not going to justify it. I'm going to let you know I'm going to fight against it. Even our very flesh attacks us when we're weak. Even our very flesh begins to rear its ugly head when things are not going our way. The world, the devil, the flesh, it does not normally have a frontal assault. That's why the Bible tells us in 1 Peter, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, the devil, walking about as a roaring uh, lion, seeking whom he may devour. Who's weak? Who's struggling? Now, if you're here this morning, you're like, well, thank goodness, because uh, I don't struggle. I'm never weak. Well, then just go to sleep. That's not going to help you. (laughs) Not going to help you at all. But the reality of it is, is we are constantly under attack, but it is not an attack that we are necessarily aware of. It's not an attack that we're necessarily warned about, but there's always this attack that's coming, and it's coming for the weak parts, and it's coming for the feeble parts, and it's coming for those that can't protect themselves, and it's coming in those areas of life that we've neglected, perhaps. It's coming in those areas of life that we have not uh, put a hedge of protection around, and we've, we've not been careful with. And this attack is coming. Now, we recognize that the attack is coming. We recognize that our flesh would fight against us. We recognize that the devil would try to destroy us. And it makes perfect sense that the devil would not play fair. Can I tell you, this is not fair. If I can say this also, they're still fighting this way where they continue to not fight fair. You can go over to the Middle East today and still find people that are fighting and trying to destroy women and children and to destroy the weak instead of coming head on and saying, my strength against your strength. That's still the way they fight. So it should not be any surprise to us that the devil would fight that way, that our flesh would rear its head that way. But the question is, what about victory? What about victory? I don't know about you, but, but I have seen times in my life and I've seen Christian after Christian after Christian who knows they're a believer. They know Christ is their Savior. They know heaven is their home. But I'm going to tell you, they don't live in victory. They live in constant fear and they live in constant acknowledgement that those areas of weakness in their life are continually being uh, sources of defeat and they find themselves falling and falling and falling, and falling, and they're about fed up with it. So what about victory? The Bible tells us that these things in the Old Testament were written for our example. I'm going to tell you, Amalek is a picture of the flesh. Guess how long God said that they would fight Amalek? From generation to generation. Even when they were strong. You can continue. You know who fights Amalek? Okay? You continue. King Saul will fight Amalek. He's supposed to utterly destroy him. He doesn't do it. King David will fight Amalek. I mean, at the strongest point in Israel's history, guess who they're fighting? Amalek. And Amalek always fights the same way. In 1 Samuel chapter number 15, when God's telling Saul to go destroy Amalek, he says, remember how they fight. Remember what they did unto thee in the way. Always going after the weak. Always going after the feeble. And so we're going to be fighting the flesh from our entire generation, for our entire life. And the flesh doesn't play fair. And continually fighting the flesh and continually fighting the flesh. So the question is, how do we get victory? It's interesting, the picture that is given to us. Look what it says here in verse number 9. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men, and go out and fight with Amalek tomorrow, and I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. And so Joshua did as Moses said unto him, and fought with Amalek, and Moses and Aaron and Hur went up on top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand, and later his hands, that Israel prevailed. When he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. 
And Aaron and her stayed upon his hands, stayed up his hands, one on the one side and the other on the other. His hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Now, it's kind of an interesting thing that takes place. Moses says, Here, what we're, here's what we're going to do. We're not going to allow them to continue. We're not going to continue to sit back and watch them pick off the weak. We're not going to sit back and just act like nothing's wrong. We're not going to sit back and pretend nothing's happening. Can you hear the reports coming in day after day? Hey, Moses, I need to let you know we lost another to the Amaleks. The Amalekites, we lost another. Oh, they, they came in and in and, and the dead of night, they came in and swooped on that, the weakest family and, and stole them from us. Moses said, I'm done acting like nothing's wrong. Can I tell you what a big problem sometimes with Christians? You know what we do? Nothing's wrong. Everything's okay. I am fine. I'm, everything's okay. Can I help us? We're probably not as fine as we say we are. Everything is probably not as okay as we pretend it is. Okay? Now, I will tell you that when there's victory, we can celebrate the goodness of God. We can say, in reality, God is good. But oftentimes we find ourselves getting into this position where we pretend like there's victory, but there is really no victory. We have to stop and say, okay, there's going to have to be a battle. There's going to have to be a battle. My flesh is winning. There's going to have to be a battle. So how are we going to fight? I've heard this passage preached before with this idea. The emphasis is all about Moses. All about Moses. You need a Moses. And a lot of times that would then equate in our day and age to that spiritual leader in your life, which would be the pastor. You need a pastor. Can I help you with something? You do need a pastor. You do need a Moses. But that's not the point of the passage. Okay? That's, a, that's something that happens in the passage. Others have preached about the fighting men, Joshua and his men that went down to fight. You need to fight. Can I help you with something? You do need to fight. But that's not the point of the passage. Okay? God does cooperate with men. He does use men. You know the passage in Ephesians where the Bible says, God does exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. That's normally where we stop the verse. But you know what it goes on to say? As he does that effectually working in us. God works and uses men. You need to fight the flesh. You need a Moses. But we're missing the point of the passage. You ever wonder why Moses raised his hands? What's the point? Is it just simply an illustration of victory, defeat? Victory, defeat. You ever wonder why Moses raised? Take your Bible. We were just here on Wednesday night and go back to Psalm And there's numerous places you could find it. You can find it also in the book uh, of Nehemiah. But look at Psalm 28. Psalm 28, we were in this passage on Wednesday night, and I just want to read it to you. It says this in verse number 1, Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. Be not silent unto me, lest if thou be silent unto me, I become like them that go into the pit. Hear the voice of my supplication when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands towards thy holy oracle. In the book of Nehemiah, the Bible says that they were lifting up hands before the Lord. In the Jewish culture, in, in, this, in the system that is being developed, you know how they prayed? With lifted up hands. In fact, in the book of Nehemiah, when they lift their hands up, they're not lifting their hands up like sometimes we lift our hands up, you know, and, and make it a, a, a sort of a celebration. Here's what they were doing. I have nothing. I have nothing that can produce victory. You can see David lifting his hands 
towards the most holy place uh, there in the tabernacle, saying to God, God, when it comes to my ability to be victorious, I have nothing. Now, it's interesting, Moses' hands are not empty. But he did not hold anything of himself. He did not go, I am Moses. You know what he held? The rod of God. We have seen over and over again how the rod of God is a picture of God's word. And he's holding up the promises of God. You know what God has promised them? He's promised them an inheritance. He's promised them a victory. He's promised them a new land flowing with milk and honey. And so he holds up, and you can see Moses holding up the promises of God. He has no victory in his hands, but he holds up the promises of God, and he says, God, you've given us promise. You've given us victory. You've declared it to us. And he he sets his hands up in prayer. And guess what? When he prays, there is victory. Now, when he puts his hands down, there is defeat. This is why we know that victory did not come from the fighting men. Did not come from the strength of the fighting men. Now, this is a unique balance. We know that victory did not come from the fighting men because when Moses let down his hands, what happened? The Amalek, they won. They prevailed. But when Moses lifted up his hands, who prevailed? Joshua. And when they were prevailing, who was doing the fighting? Well, certainly God was providing the victory, but who was doing the fighting? Joshua and his men. Such a unique thing that though the victory is with the Lord, the battle is fought by us. The victory is the Lord's. He proved it. Put your hands down. You cannot do anything without God. Put your hands up. You can do anything with God. And the victory is the Lord's. So the hero is not Joshua and his men, though they were necessary. Can I tell you, the hero is not Moses. You see what he says? He's raising his hand. You ever tried to hold something above your head for a while? I remember years ago when I first got out of college and was going through some, at a camp I, that my wife and I worked at, we were going through some lifeguard training, and uh, we were both lifeguards for a long time, and, and, uh, or she was for a long time, and we had to hold a 10-pound weight above our head while we treaded water for two minutes. That was not easy. That 10-pound weight started to feel like 100 pounds before long. It gets weary. And it's difficult. You imagine Moses, even in the spiritual activity that was being produced, there was some weariness. There was some weariness that took place. And so here you see Aaron and her. They come by and they hold up. They hold up the hands. Now I'm going to try to illustrate this. Good, I got three right here. Grab me a chair. You be Moses. You be Aaron. (laughs) You be her. (laughs) So just pull one chair up here. All you Joshua and fighting men, okay? You guys be Amalek. You guys be Joshua. No actual fighting, okay? (laughs) Sit down, Moses. So he's holding up his hands. He's got the rod of the Lord in his hand. Here he is. He's holding up his hands. Don't lose my place, okay? He's And after a while, it becomes weary. There is victory as long. I'm going to tell you, this represents prayer, okay? There is victory as long as... As his hands are being uh, held up, the prayer is going to happen in the victory. But pretty soon, his hands begin to get weary. His hands begin to get weary. And when his hands get weary, the battle turns away from the people of Israel, and the Amalek begins to win. And so pretty soon, they see the difference. It's almost Moses, in his wisdom, knew that there was going to be some difficulty. Why did he even have Aaron and her up there? Okay? Okay. And so he says, guys, I can't do it. And so here comes Aaron holding up one hand. Here comes her. They hold up the other hand. And while they're doing this, the victory is happening. 
Now, let me just help you with something. We, in our short-sightedness, go, man, way to go, Moses. Woohoo! Or we go, way to go, Joshua. Woohoo! that's awesome. Or we go, way to go, her, and way to go, Aaron. And we love to pick out our heroes. Either the hero is Moses, or Aaron and her, or Joshua. Can I tell you who the hero is? God! God is the hero. He can't do it on his own. He cannot do it. He's too weary. He's too weak. He can't do it. Joshua and them can't do it on their own. These guys can't do it on their own. If they could, they wouldn't need Moses. We're all feeble and weak. But can I tell you who brought the victory? God brought the victory. God is the hero of the battle. And sometimes we get confused because we begin to see and point to these individuals as the hero or point to Joshua and his men as the hero. You're missing the point. God's the hero. Without Jesus, you can do nothing. But I'm telling you, with Christ, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Well, why would he need to strengthen me? Well, guess who's actually going to fight? He's going to provide the victory, but I'm the one that's going to fight. Now, let me help you with something. And you guys just stay there. In the process of the children of Israel, a lot of times we would equate this, and, and I think it's the right thing to do, to we take the story of the Old Testament and we translate it to the New Testament and we apply it to us as New Testament believers. The Bible tells us to do that in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Okay? And here's what happens sometimes. We get confused. Because here's what we'll say. That Moses is the spiritual leader. Would we agree Moses was the spiritual leader? Most certainly. Did they need Moses? Most certainly. Most certainly they did. But let's talk about what Moses was doing. Was Moses determining their direction and where they went? No. He was just first in line following the cloud. Right? All Moses was doing was helping them with their problems and struggles while they made their way to the promised land. Providing wisdom, but not providing victory. Providing an example but not providing victory. At the Red Sea, God says, Moses, part the water. No. He said, take the rod of the Lord. Put it in the water. Okay? Moses, who does represent the spiritual leader. You need a spiritual leader. Hey, I, I'm not ashamed to say, you need a pastor in your life. That's why God instituted the church. That's why he has this local place. You need a Moses in your life. You need somebody in your life to do that. But can I tell you, I cannot determine for you the direction of God. All I can do is point you toward the cloud. I cannot provide for you victory. I can't even provide for myself victory. All I can do is be an example and help you with your troubles while we make our way through this wilderness. And to be honest, even Moses needed help. So here's what we do. We take this picture and we preach this message and we say, you need to be an Aaron and you need to be a her to help hold up the arms of Moses. Now, is that true? Most certainly. But can I tell you, we oftentimes miss the point. You do not hold up the arms of Moses. You okay? Good. You do not hold up the arms of Moses for the benefit of Moses. You do not hold up the arms of Moses for the exaltation of Moses. In fact, the Bible or the battle was down in the valley. You hold up the arms of Moses simply in cooperation as what this represents in cooperation of praying for the God of heaven to provide victory. That's what you do. Praying for the God of heaven to provide 
victory. Then we say, hey, you need to be one of Joshua's few good men. And then I say, pick out some men and go fight. You need, do you need to be one of Joshua's few good men? Yes, you do. But can I tell you, if we are not careful, we'll miss the point. We'll take out our swords. I'm one of Joshua's men. I got a Moses up on the hilltop. Let's go fight. And you'll leave God completely out of the equation. Let me prove it to you. What normally is the weakest area of our Christian life? For most people. What normally is the weakest area of our Christian life? Prayer. Prayer is where we declare dependency upon God. When you got saved, I sure hope you prayed and declared dependency upon what Christ did for you on the cross. It's very tough, impossible to get saved without you personally speaking to God and asking for forgiveness and declaring dependency upon God. Well, if it's impossible in terms of salvation, then why would we think that we can be in the position of Moses or Aaron or her or Joshua and the men and fight the battle with about, without the most important thing? The declaration of continual dependency upon God. Now look at the picture. Moses doesn't go, God, we're dependent upon you. All right, let's go. How long do you have to keep his hands up? The whole battle. Till the sun went down. I'm going to tell you, that's weary. That's hard work. To declare dependency upon God. I just think this is the most hilarious scene in the world. That is the picture of victory right there. In our mind, we don't equate victory with this. We equate victory with activity. But can I tell you, we access victory through prayer. That's where we access victory. And we leave it out. We fight the Christian fight. We fight against the flesh. We fight against Amalek. And we wonder why we don't have victory. We wonder why we struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle. And God's going, because you have not declared dependency upon me. And you, maybe occasionally, okay? If, if Moses in this story represented what our prayer life is like, it'd be like jumping jacks. I'm not going to actually do jumping jacks because that would take work. But that's what our prayer life is like. Okay, God. Okay, God. Okay, God. Where the picture that is given... You say, is this ever presented anywhere in the New Testament? The Bible says something about pray without ceasing. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In other words, it is the access to victory. But it's what we do the least. And here's how we try to solve the problem. Let me tell you how we try to solve the problem. Here's how we do it. We're out here fighting. We're out here fighting. Okay? And we're not having victory. So we're like, well, obviously something is wrong here. So (laughs) you obviously are a loser. So we need a new leader. Ha-ha! Victory! Yeah, but changing, can I just help you with it? You do need a Moses. And I'm going to tell you, if your Moses is not acting like a Moses, probably you need a different Moses. But having a different Moses is not going to bring you victory. Because God is the one that brings victory. Because I'm going to tell you, the description of Moses, whichever one he is, is that he's weak and he can't do it. He's weary. He can't do it. Ah, we'll change Moses. No, 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 no. It's not the Moses that brings the victory. It's God that brings the victory. Are we really going to debate who's more important, Moses or God? 
The fact that God brings a victory doesn't change the fact that you need a Moses. The fact that God brings a victory doesn't change the fact that you got to get out in the fight. The fact that God brings a victory doesn't change the fact that you might need to be an Aaron or a her. But we put all the focus on these individuals and forget God is the one that produces the victory. And so often we become glorifiers of men. We elevate men to a status. But the picture of Moses is that he was a feeble, weak old man who is just wanting God to have the victory. Praise the Lord for his submission. Praise the Lord for his willingness. But can I tell you, it was God that brought the victory. God is the hero of the story. And whenever God ceases to be the hero of your story, That's when defeat begins in your life. What we find ourselves doing is thinking that we can fight the flesh without God's intervention in our life. And I'll tell you, let me just, you guys step down here for a second. You be Moses for a second. Can I tell you what happens in a lot of places? We have a person in the position of Moses that goes, I am the one that will produce victory in your life. I am the one. And for a while, they can be a shining light, right? But what do we know about all men? They're weak. And how many churches and pastors and people have been greatly hurt by thinking that this guy can bring them victory? And he doesn't help by telling them that he can bring them victory. He doesn't help by thinking in his own life that he doesn't need somebody to come alongside him and help him so that God can bring the victory. We are silly, silly people. God is the hero of the story. And it doesn't matter how great the battle is. It doesn't matter how small the battle is. The victory is the Lord's. You will be in a dangerous position when you begin to uh, assert God's victories as your victories. Think of King Saul. Did God give him victories? You know where the trouble came? When he began to assume the victories were his victories and not God's victories. David. You know when the trouble came? When he began to view that his victories, the victories were his victories not God's victories. Peter. You know when the trouble came? When he began to view the victories as his victories and not God's victories. And we get all messed up in our Christian life. Because as long as we have a Moses, we're okay. Can I tell you? Praise the Lord for Moses. But all he's doing is pointing to the cloud. All he's doing is praying for help. All he's doing is helping with trouble along the way. When you look at the next chapter, he can't even do that by himself. You need a Moses. You you need an Aaron. You need a her. You need to be in the battle. But success only comes when we recognize that God is the victory. That God is the one that fights the battle. Have you ever heard preachers say this? Is your life like a roller, if your Christian life like a roller coaster? Up and down and up and down and up and down. Why is that? Can I tell you? It's simply because we pull back dependency from God and put it on us. How, God, how often does God make victory available? How many temptations does God allow you to escape? All of them. How many times does God offer you victory? Every single time. So why do we not always have victory? Well, either we're not recognizing that we need God for the victory, or in our weariness, we put our hands down. We quit. The most important thing, prayer. We were talking in Sunday school this morning. You know what happens when difficult times come? 
as humans, we find ourselves desiring to hibernate and isolate. That's what we do. Moses is not a picture of hibernation or isolation. You know where he went? On top of the hill. Held his hands up. And you look at the scene. It's not some, this would not work in a modern Hollywood movie. It would not. Can you imagine the battle cry? He's holding his hands up again. Let's fight. What? That's because Moses is not the hero. Aaron's not the hero. Hur's not the hero. God is a hero. You say, what's the big deal? In the passage, this is what God says. I want you to write this down as a memorial. And I want you to rehearse it to Joshua. I want you to tell it to Joshua over and over again. Why? Because the battle's not over. The battle's not over. And sometimes we rest in past victories. We put our hands down. Everything's okay. And God wants to create a continual dependence upon him step by step moment by moment paul says in essence thought by thought as he brings every thought into captivity because god is the hero as christians we've spent too much time trying to find some preacher to be our hero can i tell you who the hero is of your story jesus christ And if you will put dependency upon him, he will produce victory. If you do not have victory, it's because you've put dependency back upon yourself. Can you understand that in terms of salvation? For a person to get saved, thanks buddy. For a person to get saved, they have to put dependency upon God. They have to put their faith and trust in Christ. Can a person get to heaven without putting their faith in Christ? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Nobody can go to heaven without putting their faith and dependency upon Christ. Not a single person. And we as Christians are naive to think that we can make it through one day in battling the flesh without dependency upon Christ. But who does God give the victory in the area of salvation to, if they ask him? Has God ever responded to the the prayer of a sinner that says, God, please save me. I want to put my faith in you and trust in you. Has he ever responded and said, oh, I can't do that. He's never one time turned him down. Never one time. And here we are as Christians, thinking God can't produce in our life victory. Uh, we got our eyes in the wrong place. You need a Moses. You need an Aaron. You need a her. You need to be in the battle. But the victory is the Lord's. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, that we would be obedient in terms of placing our dependency upon you. Lord, we have developed such a sense of man worship in the church, as we have elevated some people to a pedestal. Lord, praise the Lord for Moses' men of counsel, men of wisdom, men that declare truth, and men that are examples. Praise the Lord. And Lord, we need them in our life. Lord, but help us to not be so naive as to think that those men can bring us victory. Lord, praise the Lord for helpers. Lord, praise the Lord for servants, Aaron and hers, that are willing to come alongside and lift up the arms of of Moses and be there to cooperate and help. But Lord, help us to not be so naive as to think that they produce victory. Lord, praise the Lord for Joshua and his men who are down in the dirt of it and fighting and doing those things. But Lord, help us to not be so naive as to think that they produce victory. Lord, may you receive the glory. And what a beautiful picture it is. Whatever position that we're in, 
whether we're the Moses or the Aaron or the Her or the fighters, when we recognize that you give us the victory. Lord, help us. Help us to fulfill those roles faithfully, recognizing that you give us the victory. Lord, sometimes it seems like as Christians, we don't really believe victory is available because we're so consumed with the failures of men. Lord, victory doesn't even come through men. It comes through the God of heaven that can provide it every single time. Help us.